It's Life Church. Happy, uh, happy Labor Day weekend. Did you get it right? Yeah, it's this weekend, isn't it? It's good to see you. Open your Bibles up to Genesis 32, and uh, I'll extend what Matt already gave, a Grace Life welcome. We're so thankful that you're here today, and uh, Lord willing, ready to engage in His Word. So we'll jump in that text in just a minute. First, I want to pray and ask God's blessing on our time. Heavenly Father, we are here in dependency on you and asking you to do that which only you can do. We read about this story of Jacob wrestling with you and the blessing that came to him as a result of that. It did not come without a struggle. It did not come without deep pain and honesty and brokenness. And that's always been the paradigm in the Bible. Blessing comes with great brokenness. And any Christian would testify to that, not only at their conversion, but subsequent to that, Lord, in their sanctification or even before in their conviction time. So I pray today if there's someone here and they have the blessing they've sought their whole life, maybe in ways that they're not even aware of, has been so elusive to them that they would be confronted with the reality of getting real with you, being open, being honest, and that you would break down those walls Breakthrough is on the other side of of breakdown. So I pray you would do that which only you can do today. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus. No blessing comes without that, Lord. So we ask and pray these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it was 2 a.m. on April the 14th, 1996, and an officer, a very kind police officer, pulled me over. That was a Sunday morning, very early Sunday morning. He pulled me over. I was headed home. It had been a very long day. It had been a long night. I'd been fishing with friends, and then I went to a party with my buddies. Then I dropped my friend's boat off and unhooked the trailer, and I was headed home when I saw the blue lights behind me. And uh, Sergeant Lewis walked up to my truck window, and he asked me if I knew that my brake lights weren't working. And I said, I'm not surprised. That's happened before. I was pulling a boat trailer. The fuse probably got blown. It's a defect in my my truck. And then he shined a spotlight, and, you know, he did the reverse. When they do the reverse with the flashlight, you're like, "Uh uh-oh. And he's looking around, and he said, son, have you been drinking? And I said, no, sir. No, sir, I don't drink. Because I was a pretty clever kid, man, and I was uh, a smooth talker, and I was a charmer. And I was usually able to to get out of situations that I was in. But he shined the light down and he said, whose open beverages are those? And he said, you mind stepping out of the vehicle for me, son? And then I knew, game over. Time's up. So he got me out of that vehicle and he performed a field sobriety test on me, which I promptly failed. And then he asked me to breathe in this device they had that was kind of new at the time, a breathalyzer. And I said, sure, I'll do that. And that confirmed what he already knew and what I already knew. So he put me in his cruiser about 2.30 at that point, and he took me downtown, and he arrested me for a DWI, driving while intoxicated. And about 3 a.m., I called my dad to, uh, to come and pick me up, and he came and he got me. And my dad, no judgment at all, love, tenderness, understanding, And we lived in the country, and I was in the city in jail when he came to get me. And I think that was the longest and most awkward and uncomfortable car ride I have ever been in. But it had nothing to do with my dad being there, if you catch my drift. I think hot tears of of grief and distress and anguish were just running down from my eyes. And by that time, it was 3.30, 4 a.m., and my dad and I didn't really talk a lot. I got home. And I slunk off to my room, and then I woke up the next day to a very quiet house, sunshine beaming through the the blinds in my room, and I realized it was Sunday morning, and that I had the house all to myself. My family was at church, and I was alone in my room, and man, did I ever feel alone. I don't think I've ever felt that alone in my life. There was nobody there to talk to. I wasn't in a habit of praying to God. The only time I'd ever prayed was for God to give me what I wanted my way so that I could keep ignoring him and live life on my terms. 
but it was a quiet house. And here's the sad thing, ladies and gentlemen. Were that officer to ignore me and were I to make it home, I would have been up in the same pew in the balcony and at Eastside Baptist Church that I had been in for years. And I would have, I knew social etiquette. I knew who I needed to, to see me, the pastor, shake hands, pay attention, jot down a note or two, have my Bible with me, smile, wave. I knew I was a charmer. And uh, God said, time's up, game's up. It's time for you and I to meet, son. I don't think I've talked to anybody for a week. I don't think I've ever remembered being that ashamed. Not only did I feel guilty, I'd felt guilty for some time, but I just felt empty. Have you ever felt that way? Most people you talk to, you hear their testimony of being converted, you either hear the theme of, I felt guilty or I felt empty. I felt both, heaps of both. So I didn't go to church that morning, but I did meet with God, and we had words. And I don't mean like, like yeah, I had words with God. No, I, I mean, I wrestled with God that morning, and it was something beautiful happened, the beginning of something. See, I thought that was the end. I thought my life was over as I knew it. But it turns out my life was really just beginning because I'd never had an encounter with God. It felt like, I'm not going to use the word literally, <laughs> it's overused a little today, isn't it? It felt like a face-to-face -face encounter with God that I had never had before, that God had me right where he wanted me and right where I needed to be, but I also felt cornered. I felt trapped. I don't have a mugshot of this. I'm thankful that I don't. I'm not handcuffed. I'm wearing orange, but I do have this. That's the ticket that I was given there on the left. And, uh, and on the right is uh, this, this could have very well been the front page newspaper of the little town I grew up on. It, it would be hard for me to explain to you in 2024, living in central Florida, the stigma of getting a DWI in that little northeast town in Arkansas. It was, it was the thing that everybody, everybody drank and drove my age. But when you got caught... When the game was over, then you were outed. You were viewed as trash, and, and you were viewed as, uh, you're an outsider, man. The, 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 we're done with you. You're damaged goods. So this, when I went to court a month later, this came out. Tommy Clayton, 21, convicted. Those words, just convicted of driving while intoxicated. He was sentenced to 30 days in jail, suspended for six months on the condition he complete 80 hours of public service, attend DWI school, order to pay 825, Placed on probation six months, driver's license suspended for 90 days, ordered to install an ignition interlock device on his vehicle for six months. Man, let me take that down. I don't want to see that anymore. <laughs> I was recently at home for the weekend visiting my mom and just some old stuff that had been kept for me. And man, I just kind of relived that night and I, I thank God for it because that's the worst thing that's probably ever happened to me um, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Because God had to break me down. That's what grace is, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't it? It's God pursuing you. You've escaped. You've had life by the horns. You've been living this facade. And God ain't having it. And that's when something beautiful and powerful started happening in my life. That was the very beginning of it. Now, why don't I tell you that story? Let's get me out of the way. Because I'm no hero in this. Uh, this reminds me of a story in the Old Testament about a man named Jacob, and I've always felt like I had a lot in common with him. That's sad to say because the name Jacob, do you know what it means? Yeah, it means cheat, deceiver. It means literally in Hebrew, he who catches by the heel, like ongoing. You're a usurper. You're a fraud. You're a con man. And so I'm going to, man, this is going to be hard to do because there's the long narrative here, it, but this one event, his whole life has been leading up to this. So if you're kind of new to the Bible or new to the Christian scene, that's okay. I have to assume a little bit that you know about Jacob. He was one of the patriarchs in the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's one of the 12 tribes. Uh, no, he's not. He was the father. No, he is. He's, no, he's the father. S excuse me. Let me, get, let me get my narrative right here. He's a big deal. He's a patriarch in the Old Testament. Jacob and Esau, twin brothers. Jacob was called by God. Esau was rejected by God. So it seems like Jacob has the favor of God on his life. And like somebody else I know, he was a charmer, man. He was witty. He was, his brother was hairy. That's what Esau means. Uh, but Jacob was, was smooth skinned. He was slick. You guys ever know anybody like that? Man, they're slick. They're like a snake. You can't, you can't grab them. 
They get out of it. You think you got them cornered, you got them trapped. Oh, they get out. They get pulled over. Oh, they dodge the ticket. They're always like dodgy, you know. That was Jacob, dodgy Jacob. No matter what the situation was in, man, he could ride his way out of it. And so without even really knowing that deeply, the story, I was a Jacob. I was a cheat. I was a, a fraud because I would be at church on Sunday morning and... I was a morally upright, upstanding kid. I was the guy, if you were a mother of a sweet teenage girl that you thought was ready to date, you would want your daughter to date somebody like me if you knew me at that surface level. But underneath, I was a cheat and I was a fraud. Now, I'm not saying I, you know, robbed banks and shot people. I was probably like any normal teenage kid in the South at that time, which was to say a sinner. I was corrupt. I was wayward. We, like sheep, have all gone astray. But I was a hypocrite about it, you know? I'd be in church on Sunday morning with a smile, and so just like Jacob, just like Jacob. In fact, let me, let me put up a slide here that shows you kind of Jacob's character. Let me find it here. Yeah. Isaac was Jacob's dad, and do you remember one of the stories in Jacob's history is Jacob wanted to be blessed. He wanted desperately to be blessed. And back then, the father, the patriarch of the family, he would bless the eldest son. You receive the inheritance, you receive the blessing, the greater uh, portion, the greater blessing. So Jacob knew that, and his mother knew that. And so do you know what Jacob did to try and steal the blessing from his father? He lied. He cheated. He was a fraud. He dressed up like his brother. He put goat skin on his hair, on his arm, because it was hairy. And he walked into his older father's room when his dad was nearly blinded and he pretended to be somebody he wasn't and he stole his brother's blessing right out from under him how corrupt is that and then he stole his brother's birthright too with a bowl of stew when his brother was hungry you remember the story so his brother said this Isaac said your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing and Esau said is he not rightly named Jacob for he has cheated me these two times he took away my birthright and behold now he has taken away my blessing. And the rest of that story is Esau breathed these murderous threats under his breath and his mother heard him. Now Jacob's mother loved Jacob, but his dad loved Esau. And Jacob's mother heard Esau say, one of these days, I'm going to kill Jacob. I'm going to catch up to him and I'm going to get him for what he did. And so Jacob's mother said, look, son, you better skedaddle. You better get out of Dodge. Go live with your uncle Laban. And so that's what Jacob did. Slick, smooth-skinned Jacob escaped. He eluded the conflict. He got away. You ever know somebody like that? They never confront the reality of the source of their conflict. There's smoke everywhere, and they'll just blow that around, but the fire, they never get to that. Jacob ran away, and he went and lived with his uncle Laban for 21 years. And you remember, man, he got cheated and tricked by his uncle. What goes around comes around in the Bible. And 21 years later, Jacob has, he's, he's married Rachel, he's married Leah, He's been swindled by his uncle. There's conflict. He takes off in the middle of the night and runs away. His uncle catches up with him. There's all this drama. But finally, Jacob thinks he has put his hard days behind him. And finally, he's going back to the promised land. He's got wealth beyond imagination. He's got camels and sheep and goats and heifers. He's got two wives. He's got a a big nursery behind him. He's got all these children. He's happy and he's blessed. And then he he thinks to himself, you know what? I I need to... I need to reach out to my brother Esau and let him know, like, hey, two decades have gone by. You know, bridge, water under the bridge, man, everything's probably fine. So this is what Jacob does. He sends messengers to his brother Esau, and he says, hey, Esau, I'm, I'm coming to see you, man, and I've got, God's really blessed me, and I want to share the blessing with you. And word comes back. Do you remember what the messenger said to Jacob? The messengers came back, and they said, hey, Jacob, let me see if I can get it here. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau's brother in the land of Seir, the, co- the country of Edom, and instructed them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, See, O slick Jacob, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly af- afraid and distressed. And it's interesting, man, in Hebrew, that word 
Greatly afraid, that's no mystery. We've all been greatly afraid. Distressed. In Hebrew, you know what it means? It means you're folded in on yourself. You're, you're, tra- you're trapped. It's the same word that's used for like a package or a parcel or an envelope. You're folded in. You're sealed. You can't go anywhere. Here's slick Jacob. He's got everything together. He's got life by the horns. He's got connections. He's, he's making it and, until he's not. And he hears like, hey, you think everything's figured out? It's not. Your brother's on his way here, and he's got 400 men, which is basically saying he's coming with an army. And you got your wives and all your animals and your prosperity and all these kids. So good luck with that, Jacob. So Jacob's afraid, and he's distressed. And here's what I want to say. I know this is a long introduction. Here's why I tell you all this, because I think we hear about Christian breakthroughs all the time. We're struggling with whatever issues that we're facing, and we think, hey, there's this silver bullet. There's this secret sauce. There's this answer that, that's eluded me all my life is at this conference, man. You, you heard? You listen to this message, or you go spend the weekend, or this retreat, or this book, and look, I'm not downplaying those. Those are, can be very spiritually refreshing times to do, and, and I commend them to you, but they're no silver bullet, and sometimes the, the answers we're looking for, they don't come through those planned events, do they? It seems like the real breakthrough and the solutions are so elusive. They're just right outside of our reach. We can never get to them. Those experiences and resources fall flat. Maybe they overpromise and they underdeliver. The personal change we, we were seeking and we needed it doesn't happen. Why is that? That's because, ladies and gentlemen, so often it's the case that we really haven't faced our true issue, which is to say we haven't faced God. We haven't came face-to-face with God in a dramatic encounter because so often, in order for God to bless us, there has to be this, this brokenness. So often, brokenness is on the other side of blessing. We all want blessing. That's what Jacob wanted his whole life. He would cheat, he would steal, he would lie to get it. And he thought he had it, except he didn't. He didn't have it. He was a deeply burdened man this night. That's the same way I felt on the night when when I got pulled over, I was a deeply burdened man, and really all my life, that's all I wanted. I wanted to be blessed. I wanted favor. That's really what the word means. It means to thrive and to flourish and to prosper, and it also can be a relational term. I mean, you have favor, man. This person has smiled upon you. You have been seen. You have been accepted. The, the, the countenance, your, your face has been lifted up, your eye to eye, and that had never really happened with Jacob. It hadn't happened with his dad. It hadn't happened with his brother. Certainly didn't happen happen with his uncle Laban. He's got relational issues, ladies and gentlemen. And Jacob thinks that his problem has been his dad and his brother and his uncle Laban or his polygamous wives. That's never a good idea. But you know what Jacob's real problem was? It was Jacob. It was Jacob. See, here's the problem now. This is going to be deep. This is deep theology here. Are you ready? Wherever you go to get away from your problems, there you are. (laughs) That's the problem, right? Didn't you say that in a message once? I wouldn't have any problems at all if it wasn't for me. That, you know, I look back in every relational conflict I've ever had, and the one common denominator I've always had is I was there. Huh? Yeah. How about that? So Jacob is about to, to figure something out, and it's going to be the kindness of God. The kindness of God leads to repentance. Jacob's about to find out the source of all of his problems. It wasn't mommy. It wasn't daddy. It wasn't Uncle Laban. It was Jacob. But see, friends, that sounds easy on paper and in theory, But there are tremendous obstacles to this happening. And I want to give you three, and I want to show you how God systematically broke all of these down in this episode. And that's what happened to me, man. I would if you would have asked me, what's the what do you need, son? I wouldn't have said, you know, I think a good DWI and maybe intense shame, guilt, and embarrassment, all these things that came with it, and being shunned by the community and losing all my friends and being alone in my room for a week to rethink my life, that's probably what I need. In fact, if you would have uh, put my counselor hat on here, if Jacob would have came to me in my counselor's office and told me what was going on, I would have wanted to hold his hand and pray for him and comfort him and pray, God, strengthen. Will you please strengthen this man? Give him grace. Bless him. I wouldn't have said, hey, Lord, break him. Jacob needs to be broken. That would have sounded cruel if you came in the office. Like, will you help me? Yeah, Lord, break him. (laughs) You know? I think that sometimes. It's hard to say it out loud. That's what Jacob needed, ladies and gentlemen. He needed to be broken. Now, maybe there's somebody here today, and you don't even know it yet. You don't even know it, man. But the thing that you have eluded all your life is is this brokenness. 
So here's the three obstacles. Are you ready? And they could be said differently, sure. But this is the way I'm saying them. Number one, the obstacles you get that must be overcome is one, God has to get you alone. Now look, we talk about community here all the time. And it's not good for man to be alone. God said that first. And uh, I'm echoing it. Community is important. Uh, but, but so is solitude. So is God. When you stand before the Lord, man, your community group is not going to be there with you. Neither will your mommy or your daddy or your children or your siblings or your pastor or your community group. It'll just be you and God. Number two, weakness. Weakness. God has to get you alone. God has to show you your weakness or your vulnerability. And third, this is the big one. You got to get honest. It's the hardest thing. Jacob was a deceiver. He was a cheat, a fraud, and a con man. And God said, Jacob, it's time to talk about your name, son. Time to do business with God. So let's talk about all three of those. I'll, I'll go as quickly as I can here, okay? Because we got communion today. And remind me, at the conclusion of this service, when we celebrate what it cost God to bless us, uh, remind me to remind you to get your believing children in the back that you want to celebrate communion with you. So Jacob is... Um, your classic narcissist. In the high school yearbook, uh, Jacob would have gotten most likely to cheat, <laughs> probably. Um, and that's what his name means. And really what Jacob needs is to be changed by God, but he has to have an encounter with God. And that means just he and God. And I think if we're honest, when we're thinking very clearly, we know that, don't we? We know that Man, I need, I need to get with God. I need to get along with God. We need to talk. We need to do a sit-down, a face-to-face. -face. Now, at, at, at one level, that's terrifying, isn't it? Think about the sovereign, the almighty, your creator, standing face-to-face -face with him. It's, you think of what Isaiah said, woe to him who strives with his maker. It's terrifying at one level, but at another level, it's comforting. Because who else could possibly understand what you're going through? God, he sees, he knows, he understands, he cares. Nothing has escaped his notice. I think at one level, probably all of us had thought at least what Job said at one point. It's what Job said. He said, oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. So here's what's interesting on, on that night. In verse 23, let me see here. Here we go. So knowing slick Jacob, here's what he does, kind of sh getting through the story a little bit. Jacob was greatly afraid. He was distressed. So guess what Jacob did? Jacob started scheming. He said, well, I got all these animals here. I got my wives. I got all these kids. He started grouping them and saying, I'm going to send over gifts so that I can appease my brother, so that I can appease my brother, so that I can, in Hebrew it actually says, so that I can see his face. In other words, so that I can see his face and he'll accept me. He's sending over all these gifts, all these animals, and then he, he busts up his camp into two groups. One has Leah and her children, and the other has Rachel and her children. And the Bible says that he sends everybody over. Check it out. The same night he arose, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. Now, mark this, verse 24. Boom. This is the... This is like a deafening s sentence in Hebrew. And Jacob was left alone. See, Jacob hadn't been alone in a long time. And maybe you really haven't either because you know what, ladies and gentlemen? We live in a world filled with distractions, don't we? I mean, seriously, you got a little LED rectangle in your pocket that you can pull out and be distracted whenever you want to be. There was a comedian and a, a cultural philosopher. His name was Louis C.K., and he was on Conan O'Brien, I think, late, late night talk show, and he was talking about how people are so petrified of being alone that they'll pull out their, their smartphone at a stoplight or even when they're driving and start texting people. And, and he said, I'll look around, and he said this. He said, pretty much everyone is texting while driving. He said, because the, the prospect of being alone with their thoughts is so ultimately terrifying, they would rather murder people with their vehicles. Because we're so afraid of being alone. Why is that? Why is it people are so uncomfortable being alone? I read an article I was telling my wife the other day. There was a, a TikTok uh, 
video that went viral, and it was uh, some young people, and I'm not throwing shade on young people, uh, but it was some teenagers, and they were saying, where have all the cooing doves gone? You know, the, the, I don't know, if you grew up in the South, you would hear doves all the time. It, it would sound like, forgive me, okay? A morning dove would go, hoo, 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 hoo. You, am I getting it, Brent? Am I getting it right? And they were playing that saying, where have all the doves gone? And this guy was writing an article for uh, Samuel James's website, Digital Liturgies, and he says, they're still here. <laughs> doves haven't gone anywhere. You just need to put your phone down and, and go outside and find them. They're around. <laughs> they're everywhere. And the whole, he wasn't ranting. He was lamenting. He's like, man, people have lost the ability to be by themselves, to be in nature, to be with God, to sit with their thoughts. It, make, it puts them on, uh, on edge, makes them very awkward and uncomfortable. And he said there's something deeper going on than just an addiction with a device here. It's, there's a, uh, an underlying fear and paranoia. It's like, I have to be busy. I have to be distracted. Jacob can't be distracted. He can't text 10 people and say, what's up? He can't binge on Netflix. He can't start doing the, the death scroll. It's just Jacob. No wives, no kids, no wealth, no animals. It's just Jacob alone in the dark by himself. He's a burden man. He's a very burdened man. And you think, poor Jacob. No, no, this is the greatest blessing and gift God could have possibly bestowed upon Jacob. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, if you feel alone right now, you may be on the edge of something miraculous. Sit, sit on it. Don't, just, don't cover it up. Don't cover it over and distract it. Ask God, what are we doing here? What are you trying to do with me, God? I need something. I need this breakthrough. Jacob was alone, finally. Took a, a, a great monumental effort by God to get him there, but there he was, and his past is catching up with him, and nobody can help him. Greatly af afraid and distressed, and the silence from Esau is terrifying. Have you ever gotten a message like that? I've talked about it before, and God's helped me. You know, one of the areas I see gospel growth and, and being conformed to the image of Christ being sanctified, one of the barometer tests for me is, is I'm a lot less radically insecure than I used to be. And I'm not telling you this so that you'll never reach out to me and say, hey, we need, we need to talk. But I could get, eight years ago, I could get a text after a sermon, especially on a controversial subject, and it would be from somebody that I respect in our congregation. They would say, hey, we need to talk. And that would wreck me. And it could have been they just wanted to talk about an issue they had. It would wreck me. I was that insecure. So Jacob, the silence, being alone, not knowing, is he's, how close is Esau? Is he going to kill me or does he want to talk? He fears the worst. And then the next, the next passage here is just, it's crazy, man. You can't make this. Whoever says the Old Testament's boring hadn't read it. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the, until the breaking of the day. What? What in the heck is going on here? You guys ever read this story? Now, let me ask you a question. Now, you, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know who this is. Who is not, it's not Jacob's angel. It's not some, uh, it's not a bouncer. It's God. It's God. We know this because Hosea chapter 12 says that Jacob wrestled with God. Often, an angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate image of Christ. It's just God taking on human form. He can do that. God can do whatever he wants. And when God wants a face-to-face -face with you, in the Old Testament, sometimes he would show up in the form of a man. Can you imagine now? Let me ask you a question. Who do you think Jacob thinks this is? Who do you think he thinks it is? Use your, it's okay to use your sanctified imagination. I just about bet my life that he thought that's Esau. And maybe the form that God took was a hairy one. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he smelled like a man of the field. And he's like, oh, no, it's Esau. And he's a man of the field. He's strong. He hunts. Uh, and I'm not. I'm a man dwelling in tents. Now, Jacob had some strength. I'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. But Jacob thinks, oh, my goodness, this is my worst nightmare come true. It's dark. It's quiet. Maybe the cicadas are chirping in the Israeli wilderness. I don't know. And then out of the bushes, boom, somebody jumps on you. Until the break of day. Let me ask you a question, guys. Have you ever wrestled with somebody? <laughs> it's exhausting. It's one thing if you just stand up and then boom, boom, fight's over. But re wrestle, the word in Hebrew means to grapple. Now, if you know anything about MMA, uh, for good or for bad, that's, that's when usually the fight is it, it's exhausting. It's when you go on the mat with somebody and you're locked together. 
I mean, I used to wrestle when I was in middle school with my buddies. Man, you only last about five minutes, and that's when you're in shape. Can you imagine all night long you're engaged in this hand-to-hand combat with your equal, somebody you think's your equal? So he is alone, and he's burdened, and suddenly he's engaged. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. This is, this is a strange passage, man, because it seems like, okay, J- Jacob's wrestling with God, an angel, I guess, but it looks like Jacob's winning. And this guy's like, oh, no, Jacob's beat me. Yeah. And you're like, what's going on here? And then he goes, oh, and then he reaches out and, t- <laughs> and he touches his hip. God's got on kid gloves here, doesn't he? Yeah. It's not like God's pretending to be weak. God wants Jacob to engage him. And Jacob's like, Jacob thinks he's going to get out of this. He's like, hey, I'm going to win. And God goes, no. And he touches his hip socket. And he, that's your wrestling pivot, man. If you don't have your legs, you're done in wrestling. You are finished. It's game up. So God has to get us alone. And that's what Jacob is. He's alone. He's in the dark. Ron Dunn preached a sermon about this years ago. And the sermon was called, surprise, it's God. It was one of the best sermons I've ever heard from the Old Testament. And he said, so often God waits until we're, we're alone and we're afraid and we're in the dark. And that's when God often shows up. Yeah, praise God, man, because he does show up. That's what grace is. God's relentless. So often this being alone, is, it's, it's not only being undistracted. It's, it's having all your resources taken away from you. The things that you trusted in. Have you ever thought like, hey man, life's hard. It's, it's under the curse. It's brokenness everywhere, but I got a backup plan. I'm connected. I got friends. I know so-and-so. They'll get me out of this. I'm, res- I'm resourceful. I know the right people. I've st- I'm still clever. I'm intelligent. There's like a back, there's a fallback plan. We've all got a fallback plan, and that keeps us really from our dependency on God. And so, so often what God does is he cuts that out. Remember that joke when you were like, elbow props are dangerous. When somebody's leaning on their elbows, that's what God does. He cuts off all his resources. And Jacob sees like, I'm, I have no help here. I have no backup plan. It's just me. It's, it would be like a soldier going into a battle, and you take away his shield, and you take away his sword, and you take away his bow and his arrow, and you take away his armor. And you go, how you feeling right about now? Vulnerable? This is kind of a disillusionment. We're, we're about to go through a book in our community groups by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and it's called Life Together. He has an incredible statement there where he says this. He says, the sooner, he's talking about disillusionment. We all have to face, have you ever been disillusioned? You thought life was going to go this way, and it went that way. And it's like a death. It feels like a death. This was your dream, and God shattered your dream. Because that wasn't his dream. That was just your dream, and it wasn't a good one. It didn't lead to a good, healthy place of blessing. And so God had to kill it. He had to destroy it, and you felt like he was destroying you. Bonhoeffer talks about that. He says, the sooner this shock of disillusionment comes to an individual and to a community, the better for both. So Jacob's dream is getting shattered. He thinks all his problems are behind him, but they're not. They're not. He's just never really faced the source of all of his problems, and God's going to make him face that source. One man wrote this, God does not leave us to our fantasies. He exposes the truth of our troubled lives so that we might look to him as the answer. He allows life to become often unbearable. He allows a no-choice impasse so that we cry out for help. Sometimes this is part of our conversion. There's a lady, her name is, I hope I pronounce it right, her name is Ayan Hershey Ali, She was born in Somalia in poverty. She escaped fundamentalism, Islam, and she escaped an arranged marriage. In 1992, she found asylum in the Netherlands. And then after 9-11, she turned decisively against the religion of Islam, saying it was insanity. And she rebelled against her upbringing, and she became a leading voice in the new atheism. And secular historians hailed her as a hero until one day she converted and she became a Christian. And she acknowledged that on a stage with Jordan Peterson, and it shocked the whole world, man. Everyone hailed her, all these new atheists hailed her as their intellectual hero, and then she turned on them and she said, no, this is, I've become a Christian. Here's what she said. She said, my spiritual awakening came from mental agony, 
In other words, she was trapped. She was put in a corner. She was greatly afraid and distressed. I ultimately found life without my spiritual solace, unendurable, indeed, very nearly self-destructive. She said, and the only person that would tell her that was a Christian therapist that she stumbled onto, I guess. And the therapist said, hey, look, your problem is not trauma from your ex-religion and from the life you escaped. She said, your problem is you're spiritually bankrupt. You're looking for, in this new atheism, what God has already provided through a son. And she said that was the breakthrough she had to have. Often it happens when we see the prevailing worldviews lead to, to emptiness. Martin Lloyd-Jones is one of my heroes. He was a British pastor in the 1920s, and he was one of the most promising up-and-coming physicians. And everyone was telling him he's going to be this famous doctor. And something happened, and he felt the call of God on his life, and he turned his back on a promising medical career, and he engaged in full-time vocational pastoral ministry. And people asked him what happened, and he shared a story that, you know, you got to understand, back in Britain, doctors were heroes. Everyone wanted to be a doctor. They, they had life, man. They were the world, they were the world breakers. And so Lloyd-Jones, there was a man he looked up to, and, and, and honestly, he wanted to become this man. He was an older, uh, established, accomplished, successful doctor, and he came by to see Lloyd-Jones, and everyone had heard that this man was dating a woman younger than him, and she had died, and there was tragically, suddenly, and there was nothing this doctor could do to save her. And he asked Lloyd-Jones if he could come by and see him, and Lloyd-Jones said, sure. And it was cold, it was in London, and there was a fireplace going there, and he said, do you mind if I sit by the fire? And Lloyd-Jones says, of course. And the guy pulled his chair up, and he sat in front of a fireplace for two hours, and he stared into the fire, and he didn't say a word to Lloyd-Jones. And Lloyd-Jones, reflecting later, said, it was at that moment that I looked at this man staring with hollow, vacant eyes into the fire, and I knew the, the, the illusion of all human vanity and greatness. He saw that this man, as great as he was, had no resources to help himself. And he said, I, don't, I didn't want to become that anymore. That man was alone. He didn't find a breakthrough there, but Lloyd-Jones did. And so often that's what happens. God has to show us the vanity, the illusion of our dreams. So that was the first thing, is alone. Very often, that's the obstacle. We're so distracted. We're so busy. We're in such a rush with whatever it is. We're covering up the deeper problems. God has to get us alone. And number two, here's the second thing he has to do. God has to break us down and weaken us. It's crazy. We pray for strength so often, uh, but a lot of the times what we really need is we need to be weak. We need to be vulnerable. We need to remember that we're human. We're limited. We're finite. And he's not. And we need to be put in our place, ladies and gentlemen. And God has to do that. And what's, it, what's so interesting to me that what Jacob thought he needed was to be fixed. And, then, and again, were he to come to me in a counseling room, I would view him as, okay, Jacob needs to be fixed. But you know what God did to Jacob? He broke him. He broke him. He touched him at his strongest place, physically speaking, at his hip socket, and he wrestled, wrestled it out of joint so Jacob couldn't go anywhere. And you see this all throughout Scripture, man. This is a theme. God would use us, but we're too strong. He has to cripple our self-sufficiency, right? He has to break us where it hurts, touch us where it hurts the most. That's what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, God's strength is made perfect in my what? Weakness. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 26. Let me see if I can find it here, if I put it up here. There was a man by the name of King Uzziah. If there was ever a second Solomon, this was the dude. He was an engineer. He was intelligent. He was wealthy. He had intuition. He was successful. He was wise. He was an amazing king and a great leader. And it lists, there's this long paragraph, and it lists all his accomplishments. And then it says, his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped until he became strong. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. If you know the story, Uzziah went into the temple and he tried to offer incense and sacrifice. And God said, uh, that's not for you, buddy. That's, that's for a priest. You're, not, you're no priest. You're a king. There was only one prophet, priest, and, and king who could fulfill all three of those. And it wasn't him. And it ain't us, right? And God gave him leprosy. And he was ushered out. And he was a leper till the day that he died, pretty much. In fact, that's in Isaiah. God doesn't even reveal himself to the nation of Israel until Uzziah died. The year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Remember Isaiah 6? Anyway, so often, what, what, an obstacle for God is our strength. We're just too strong. We're too self-sufficient. We're too dependent on us. 
Whenever we've gotten in a bind, we've always looked to number one to get us out of that bind. And God has to break us of that. So that's what he does, man. In this story, he has to break Jacob down. So the last part of this, he says, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he had to to recognize his vulnerability. A.W. Tozer has a great quote, man, where he says this. He says, It is doubtful whether God can bless a man, and I would add, or a woman, greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Now, that's a scary quote, isn't it? I don't really like it, but it's true. How many people in here know that quote's true experientially? Yeah. God will use you when you open yourself up to him, and very often, uh, if you don't do that and God's going to use you, you've got to be broken. You've got to be worn down. I mean, you think about this. Jacob thinks the very next day he's going to meet Esau. And in his mind, he's he's scheming. He's not turning yet in desperation. He even prayed, Lord, deliver me from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am very afraid. He still thinks Esau is his problem. And that's what he's asked God. You ever pray and say, Lord, remove this, remove this, remove this. And God's like, no, I'm I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to deliver you from your true problem. But in order to do that, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Have you ever needed your wits about you needed a good night's sleep? This happens to me every Saturday. I'm like, I, I can't take these sleep aids because it's going to make me fuzzy in the morning. And who knows what I'll say? Uh, but I need a good night's sleep. And off, man, I'm thinking about the sermon. I'm burdened about it. And it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And then, oh, it's 6.30, time to get up and go over your notes. And I'm so af- afraid that I'm not well rested. And I, need, and I have to depend on the Lord. Just about every week that happens. And you guys pray for me, and God's always gracious. Um, but... Jacob needs his wits about him. He needs to get a good night's sleep. He needs to wake up, maybe find some coffee beans growing, I don't know. And, and he's got to confront his brother, and he's got to talk his way out of this, right? Jacob, t- he's smooth, man. He'll, he can talk his way out of it, except it, he doesn't get a full night's sleep. You know what he gets? All night long being worn down, thrown to the ground, grappled by God. <laughs> that would be a better name for the sermon, right? Maybe more people would come, grappling with God. He can't get away. God has him cornered. Finally, Jacob can't go anywhere. And strong Jacob gets his hip put out of socket. So, so often God touches you where you think, you're, you think that's an asset, that thing you have, that fallback plan. And God has to say, I'm taking that away from you. Because you're not desperate enough yet. You're not weak enough yet. You're not dependent enough on me yet. So I'm going to help you get there because by yourself you'll never get there. We are proud creatures, aren't we? We are so self-sufficient and stubborn and proud, and God has to break us down. It's the most loving, gracious thing God could ever do to a human being, is to kick every prop out from under them. And I know this is a narrative, and we've got to be careful as pastors. You can almost make a narrative, say anything you want. So I think it's pretty undeniable what God is doing here. He's loving Jacob with an everlasting love by weakening him and rubbing him down till he is so mentally worn down and exhausted. Jacob finally has to stop fighting. He can't do it anymore, and he has to surrender. He's like, all right, I'm not going to get out of this alive. So I'm just going to ask you, will you please bless me? I know who you are now. He knows. See, he's figured out this mysterious stranger. It's actually God, which was probably terrifying, but it was also probably a relief. Finally, what Job prayed for, I got God here face to face. Now, man, I'm, I'm just being honest here. My curiosity gets the best of me. When I'm reading a story like this, I'm like, What would it have been like, man? I mean, I'm going to ask God, can you replay the tape on that one when we get to heaven? I'd like to see that. And God can turn the lights on. I know it's dark there. But what did, it, what did God smell like? Was it, were you both sweating? Were you grunting and exertion? Was it throwing each other? I would have liked to have been there, and like wrestling with God and being weakened and worn down and exhausted and huffing and puffing and probably crying, probably snot going everywhere. You're exhausted. And Jacob says, I just want to be blessed. And you know what he's saying? He's confessing there. My whole life I've been after this. That's what he prayed. The the word face in Hebrew is used six times in this passage. It's a little bit subtle. But he says, I just want to see my brother and I want him to accept my face. I want him to see me and receive me and welcome me. And God says, you don't actually need your brother to accept you. You need me to accept you. 
You need for me to see you. You and I got to get on level to level. And to do that, I got to come down there because you can't come up here. See, Jacob's wanted to be blessed his, his whole life, but he's always lied and cheated to get it. Do you remember the last time that somebody asked Jacob what his name was? And this story, this is incredible in, in, in Genesis. The last time somebody asked Jacob, who are you? What's your name? Was his father, thinking it was Esau that he was going to bless. And Jacob's thinking, hey, I can get blessed, but I got to lie, and I got to cheat, and I got to steal. So he says, I'm Esau. He lied, and he got blessed by his father. Smooth-skinned Jacob got the blessing. Except now, this is God saying, what's your name? And here's the third obstacle, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready? You got to get alone. You got to be weak and vulnerable, and then you got to get honest. And can, and can I tell you, as your pastor, this is the, almost the insurmountable obstacle, obstacle to face because people are just not willing or able to face reality. That we're a sinner and that we're corrupt and that we need God's grace. We need his rescue. We need his intervention in our lives. But in order to get that, we got to come clean. We got to give up the goods and say, Lord, I'm a wretch and I am corrupt through and through. You know that the word Jacob, when you read Jeremiah 17, 9, and it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know what that word is? The, ba that, the, the, the base word there, the heart is a Jacob. So when, when, this is the next thing in the verse here, when he says, let me go for the day's broken. Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And finally, Jacob gave it up, didn't he? And he said, Jacob. You know what he's saying? God's saying, let's talk about your character, Jacob. Let's talk about your life. Let's talk about your flaws. If, any, if somebody met you and they said, hey, uh, my name's Tommy. Talk about your flaws. Tell me about your character. Tell me about your issues. Be honest. Let's dig deep. What would you say? Like, you're nuts. I ain't telling you that. But not here. Not now. God's got him cornered. Jacob's got to give it up. And he says, I'm a cheat. I'm a fraud. I've been deceptive my whole life, and I have enjoyed a measure of success. But I'm empty, and I'm guilty, and I'm exhausted, and I'm worn down, and I just want to be blessed. I just want to be seen. I just want to be welcomed and received. I've never had that. My father couldn't give it to me. I had to cheat. My brother hasn't given it to me. I've got these children. I've got all these possessions, and I'm still just as empty as the day before I came here. And you know what it says here? Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Then he says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Oh my goodness, man. You know, you know who this mysterious figure is in the dark? He has the power to change your destiny. He has the power to change your character. You don't have to be a cheat the rest of your life. You don't have to be a fraud, but you gotta be honest. You gotta say, Lord, I need to be changed from the inside out, and it's so elusive. I can't get there. I can't do it on my own. You gotta help me. You got to change me. I need grace. I need a miracle. I need something supernatural that's outside of me to come into my life and change me dramatically. And God said, done. That's all you had to do, son. You just had to get honest. Boy, we lie to God, don't we? And we think we're clever <laughs> and sly. You got you to get honest with the Lord. Psalm 51, Psalms, David Psalm of Repentance. It said, God desires truth in the inner parts. That's always what God is after. God sees through the facade, ladies and gentlemen. So often we're too strong, we're too clever, we're too blank for God to use, like Gideon. You're too strong, Gideon. I got to reduce you so that I get the glory. That's what God had to do with Jacob. And Jacob's name got changed that day. They got changed to Israel, and that means God fights. And the idea is, God fights for you. You got to stop fighting with him. He'll fight for you. Listen, friends, the one you've been wrestling, not, wrestling with all night has completely been in your corner all along. We're, so often we're running from God. He's been chasing us so that we'll turn around and say, Lord, I need you help. Please help. Please rescue me. Please save me. Please change me. Please forgive me. Please come into my life and do what I couldn't do my whole life. Give me the blessing that I need. And God says, I see you, I forgive you, I receive you, I welcome you. You're in my kingdom now. You are in my family. You are my beloved son, and there's nothing that can ever separate you. Now, here, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to prepare our hearts to receive communion. Do you know what it cost God 
to bless Jacob and to bless... How could Jacob, a deceiver, a cheat, a con man, a sinner, corrupt through and through? And do we have anything? Or do we have solidarity with him outside of Jesus? I think we do, right? How can a, an unholy sinner like that see God face to face? That's what he... He gave a hashtag to this place. He called it Penuel. You know what that means? I've seen God. I've seen his face. How can a sinful human being stand in God's presence face to face and not be obliterated? How can that happen? Sinful man, holy God. Something's got to happen because somebody else stood in God's presence and they were obliterated. They were destroyed. See, Jacob walked away wounded from wrestling with God while Jesus was slaughtered. Jesus was slain. Jacob wrestled with God and he got blessed only because Jesus wrestled with God and got cursed. That's quite a trade-off if you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, and a beautiful picture of the gospel. Jacob walked away, it says, with a limp. Next passage. The sun broke that day. The dawn began to break. And here comes Jacob walking. I can, I can see it now in my, in my mind's eye. I can see Jacob. His hair's disheveled. There's snot and, and, and dirt all over him and sand. And his hips out of socket. And he's, he's limping up to his family. And they're like, what in the world happened to you? And he goes, God blessed me last night. <laughs> the, it's, it's the look of sweet surrender, right? And we ran out of time today. Do me a favor. In, in your spare time on the Lord's Day, read the rest of the story, and I want you to see what happened when Esau and Jacob finally met. But I'll let you predict what probably happened. Was Esau the problem? When you, listen, ladies and gentlemen. When you are face-to-face with God, when you wrestle with God, when you face your conflict with God, your other conflicts take a, a very deep second place. And, and seem to work themselves out, strangely enough, don't they? So what did it cost God to bless you and to bless me and to bless Jacob? Well, he had to be broken. Jacob's hip was just put out of socket. He just had a limp. Jesus had to be broken. His blood, I'm sure Jacob had a bloody nose, but Jesus bled out that day, it says. And he gave up his spirit. Jacob was in God's presence. Jesus was forsaken by God's presence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what it cost God to bless us. It cost Jesus everything. Have you experienced that blessing? What's standing in the way? Let's pray. Lord, as we consider and celebrate what it cost you to bless us, I pray as we handle and taste and smell and experience these elements, thank you so much for giving this ordinance to your church for, for leaving us this visible, tangible reminder so that we might have assurance, so that we, when we forget the basis on which we have been accepted, you would remind us, Lord, that it cost Jesus a broken body and for his blood to be shed so that he could experience the wrath of God on our behalf. He could be slaughtered and cursed so that we could be blessed and, and put whole again. And so I pray, Lord, for a deep and meaningful reflection as we consider communion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I think our elders are going to come now and... We'll celebrate communion together.